good morning. How you guys doing today? Y'all doing all right? Ah, oh, one of you's all right. Man, it's so good to be back in Ennis, Texas. I grew up in Athens, Texas. Y'all know where Athens is? It's like 40 minutes or so away from here. Um, I love this part of the country. Got family, lives in Waxahachie. By the way, if you're watching at the Waxahachie campus, glad you're joining us. And anybody that's at home, we're glad you're here. But um, yeah, just a little memory, uh, walk down memory lane real quick. I played football for Athens High School. I was a down lineman. And the single worst night I ever had as a football player was against this, like, country-strong, corn-fed defensive lineman for Ennis, Texas that just wore me out all night. And so if you were a defensive lineman at Ennis High School back in 92, you scarred me for life. Thank you very much. Um, but anyway, it's good to be here. I love your pastor. He and I met on a fishing trip, and he's just one of these guys. We connected. We've been friends. And so it's good to finally be here. At, uh, at your amazing church. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to talk long this morning. I want to talk to you about Galatians 5 today. If you brought a Bible, going to be in Galatians 5. If you didn't, that's great. going to have the scriptures behind me on the screen. But let me tell you what Galatians 5 is about. It was written by the Apostle Paul, and he writes this book to the New Testament church in Galatia. And here's why that he's writing this letter to them. It's because there the, there's these guys, like this church has started, Jesus, you know, Jesus had died, rose from the grave, uh, the New Testament church started, and there's these dudes that kind of came into the church and started teaching the Christians, these brand new Christians, they started teaching them this message, they're like, hey, if you want to go to heaven, yeah, you need Jesus, you need the gospel, but you also have to follow the Jewish law if you want to go to heaven. And the Apostle Paul is writing this letter to the New Testament church, and he's writing like, no, 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 no. That's not how the gospel of Jesus Christ works. That's why it's called the gospel of Jesus Christ, which means the good news of Jesus Christ, because uh, what Paul's saying and what the Scripture is saying, that for God, to for God to love you, for God to accept you, God to be pleased with you, for you to go to heaven when you die, you don't need Jesus plus something else. But the scripture says, if you want to go to heaven when you die, you want God to be pleased with you, you need Jesus plus nothing. That's it. And that's what the whole book of Galatians is about. I think it's an important book because there have been people all throughout the history of the New Testament and, um, you know, the history of the church, 2,000 years now. Um, people have been coming along and saying, hey, Jesus isn't enough. You need Jesus some, something else. You got this group of people we're going to see today that saying you need Jesus, plus you got to follow the Old Testament law. Um, in the 14, 1500s, the Catholic Church did this. They were saying, yeah, G faith in Jesus is great, but you also have to do the sacraments, and you also have to give to the church if you want to go uh, to heaven. You, you've got... Um, 19th, 20th century, you had the fundamentalist movement that they taught you had to have faith in Jesus and you had to be baptized uh, to go to heaven. And, and then you've got some folks in the 21st century, one of the things that I'm hearing a ton of, they're like, yeah, you got to have faith in Jesus, but you also have to be baptized in the spirit, like in the charismatic movement, or you can't go to heaven. And again, Paul is screaming from the rooftops that the gospel of Jesus Christ means that you need faith in Jesus plus absolutely nothing for Jesus to be pleased with you. And when you realize that, when that hits you, you don't have to perform for God. You don't have to pull up your bootstraps and try to be a good person. But through Jesus and Jesus Christ alone, God is pleased with you, loves you, accepts you, you go to heaven when you die. When that hits your heart, Paul's point is you're going to experience freedom, Christian freedom. That's what the whole book is about. Now, let me say this. I think this is kind of important because the book of Galatians is all about Christian freedom. And, and what does that mean? What's that about? Well, the first thing you understand, church, is that the Bible's understanding of freedom, Christian freedom is different than kind of our American understanding of freedom. We, we love freedom in America, don't we? Like, we, we do. When I ask y'all a question, I was like, y'all go, yeah, or something like that. So, like, we love freedom in America, right? 
Uh, there we go. We do. That was awesome, by the way. We do. Like, we got holidays celebrating our freedom as Americans. Um, and But how do we define freedom here in the U.S.? This is how we typically define freedom. We define it this way. Number one, it says, people in the United States, we think freedom is us being able to do whatever we want to do. Right? We want to do whatever we want to do. And here's the other kind of way that we define freedom here in the United States is freedom is never having to do something that someone is forcing me to do. We got a big problem with that in this country. As a matter of fact, we exist as a country because somebody tried to get us to do some stuff that we didn't want to do. Y'all remember? Y'all remember history? England. What happened? They were like, hey, we're going to charge y'all for some tea, but we're not going to give you some representation. And our great, 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 great granddads are like, you're going to charge us what? For a glass of iced tea? No, we got to fight. And we fought them, and that's why you're sitting here today, right? <laughs> because some people tried to get us to do something we didn't want to do. But here's the thing. The Bible talks about a different kind of freedom. The Bible talks about a freedom that you can experience as a Christian that's better than even our version of freedom. It's deeper it's a deeper kind of freedom. It's a, it's a more satisfying kind of freedom. The kind of freedom the Bible talks about is a freedom you can experience on the inside regardless of the circumstances in your life. It's a transcendent kind of freedom. It's the kind of freedom that Jesus was talking about in John chapter 8 when Jesus said, if the Son, talking about himself, if Jesus sets you free, then you are really free free. That's the kind of freedom that we're talking about. And I'm going to tell you something. Biblical freedom, this kind of transcendent of circumstances kind of freedom, it's not found in you doing whatever you want to do. But real biblical freedom is found in you doing whatever it is that Jesus wants you to do. That's biblical freedom. That's what Paul is talking about today. Now, why is why is us getting our brains around biblical freedom important? All right, and here's the answer. Because our enemy, the scripture calls him Satan, he loves to enslave Christians. Now, what do I mean by that? What do I mean by enslaving Christians? Well, Christ has set us free. We're going to see that in a second. But Satan loves to get Christians that have been set free by Jesus. He loves to get you enslaved by stuff. And what I found is I've been a pastor for almost 30 years and here's what I've noticed that the enemy loves to enslave Christians with. He loves to enslave you one of two ways if you're a believer here today. Number one, he loves to enslave you with sin. You know, as we're going to see here, and hopefully you know if you're a believer here today that your sin's completely forgiven. But at times, because we're made of flesh, we run back into sin. And, and the enemy loves to get us mired in that sin, and we just get enslaved to sin, and we don't experience the freedom of Jesus because we're walking in sin. But there's another kind of enslavement that the enemy loves to get us in, and that is to enslave us through works-based Christianity. And that's what this is talking about. It's this, um, it's this Jesus. Matter of fact, can we show that first slide back there, guys? The, the C.S. Lewis had a quote where he talked about this. It's called the, the false doctrine of Jesus and, right? That's works-based Christianity. It's the idea that, that you've got to have faith in Jesus and you've got to do something else for God to be pleased with you. There are some of you in this room today you're a Christian, you love God, but you're mired in the sin of thinking that your faith in Christ is not enough for God to be pleased with you. And what the Apostle Paul is screaming from the rooftops, he's saying, Jesus Christ, if you're a believer, Jesus Christ has set you free from the Jesus and anything. He sets you free from having to follow the law. Why? Jesus fulfilled the law. He sets you free from anything you think you have to do for God to be pleased, pleased with you because of Jesus Christ. So let's jump in real quick, and let's look at this first thing he says, Galatians 5.1. Check it out. Paul, again, he starts, he's writing to Christians here. That's important to keep in mind. And look at the first thing he says. He said, is, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Now, I grew up in church. I'm going to leave that up for a second. I grew up in church. Went to seminary forever, preached forever, and just be totally honest with you, I didn't understand that first phrase for a really long time. It seems redundant to me. It's for freedom 
that Christ has set us free. What does that mean? Well, to understand what Paul is saying here, I want you to look in the first sentence there where it says, Christ has set us free. The key to understanding is in the word has, okay? That's a past tense statement. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to people who put their faith in Jesus, and here's what he's saying here. He goes, hey, Christian, I want to remind you of something. Jesus has already set you free, set you free from the law. He sets you free from Jesus' end. And so then he basically what he's saying there, since Christ has already set you free, what you need to do, church, is you need to walk in that freedom. That's what he's saying. It is for freedom that Christ sets you free. And then he says this. He says, um, and by the, you know, what, what is, and then he goes, yeah, let me go ahead and finish there. And he says, stand firm then and do not let yourself be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Okay, now let's leave that up. What was keeping these Christians from walking in the freedom that Jesus gave them? Well, Paul says, hey, you're running back to what used to enslave you. You're being, you're putting on the burden again of what used to enslave you. And what's he talking about? What was enslaving these Christians? works based Christianity, and it was them thinking they had to follow the law. That's what's going on here, and I'll explain specifically uh, what that means in a minute. But I want to kind of get our minds around, why is Jesus plus trying to follow the law, why is that slavery? Why is trying to follow the Old Testament law, why does the Bible call that slavery and a burden? Um, and I experienced firsthand in my life why trying to follow all of the Old Testament law is burdensome and slavery. Um, how many of you, has anybody in here ever like taken a trip to Israel? Has anybody ever done it? There's a couple of you. If you ever get a chance to go to Israel, I want you to go. Um, because it'll make the Bible come alive. It's crazy. Like all the stuff you read in the Bible, man, it's there. You see it. It's incredible. But I took a trip to Israel one time. It was awesome. And one of the Old Testament Jewish laws, Ten Commandments, is honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Idea being that there's one day of the week that you don't work, that you take that day, that you honor God with it. Do you remember God? You spend time with your family. You get rest. And it was meant to be, a, God did it to be a blessing to you. Um, well, the, the Jews... They turn that thing that was supposed to be a blessing and they turn it into a burden. They turn it into slavery. This Sabbath, it was meant to be a day of rest for you um, and a day of blessing to you. They, they looked at everybody and they're like, you can't work at all or you're sinning. To the point that they decided somewhere along the way in Israel that pushing a button on an elevator is considered work and that you're breaking the Jewish uh, God's law because you're working, just doing this right here. That's sin. Okay, they don't want you pushing a button on the Sabbath if you're, you're staying in a hotel. Well, I learned this the hard way. I was in a hotel. We had, uh, we were, my wife Jennifer, who's here, we were staying on like the 15th floor, right? And we had spent the whole day going and checking out stuff, the Garden of Gethsemane, the Sea of Galilee, it was amazing. We came back. About six o'clock, Sabbath or seven o'clock, Sabbath had started, and city just shuts down. And but we're about to go to dinner, and so but I forgot my wallet, okay. And so I got to go to the fifteenth floor to go get my wallet. Well, I found out in a hurry that that was burdensome. Why? Because what do we do with elevators in America? You walk into the elevator, it closes. You push number fifteen, go up to fifteen, run, grab your wallet, push number one. Go back, you're done. Takes three minutes, four minutes. But in Israel on the Sabbath, that's, that's work, that's sinning. So what do they do? How do they overcome you doing that, not working? They make the elevator stop at every single solitary floor all the way up and all the way down. I, I'm not going to do it. I don't want to bore you, but I'll just do one of them. So y'all remember, you get in the elevator, push 15. You wait for a second. Anybody coming? Nope. That thing would close. Pause go up to the first floor, pause, or opens up, right, Not, nobody there, closes, pause, second floor, all the way up to 15. 
and went and got my wallet, and I'm like, oh, dear Lord Jesus, take me home now, because I had to do it again, and I had to go all the way down, okay? That, my friends, is called slavery. That's like the Jewish leaders were taking these laws in the Old Testament that were meant to be a blessing, and they're making folks do stupid stuff, turning them into a burden, and, and that's what was going on in this church, is, is they were, you know, it's a New Testament church, Jesus had died, rose from the grave, um, Jesus fulfilled all the law when he was here, and he died on a cross, and, and, and paid for all of our sins, and, and these guys were coming in and saying, hey, that's great, Jesus is awesome, put your faith in Jesus, that's great, uh, oh, by the way, you got to also, if you want to go to heaven, follow all the law. And Paul's like, stop running back to slavery. Jesus set you free when he died on a cross. Now, um, just, uh, just kind of an interesting point here. Like what specifically was the Jewish law that these guys were coming in and saying, hey, if you want to go to heaven, you got to put your faith in Jesus, and you got to do this law. We actually find out what the law was. And, um, and let me read it to you. It's uh, Galatians 5.1. Paul says, it is for freedom that Christ has already set you free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourself be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Y'all don't be running back to the law, doing that slavery stuff. And then in verse 2, he tells them specifically what the law was that they thought they had to follow plus Jesus, to go to heaven. Paul says in verse 2, Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Now, y'all are sitting here going, man, what in the world is that dude talking about? Right? Why, 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 why is Paul talking about circumcision? And what does that have to do with slavery and the law? Well, here's what was going on. Back in the day, and I'll show you the verse in just a second, God asked his people, to get circumcised men uh, as a reminder of the covenant between God and them. I'll show you that in a second. But these Jewish people were coming in. Again, Christ died on a cross, paid for all our sins, fulfilled the law, rose from the grave, conquered sin and death. The church of Christ began. Church just like this right here, these guys were coming in. They were going, hey, Jesus is awesome. Faith in him is great. But if you want to go to heaven when you die, you got to put faith in Jesus and you got to get circumcised. Let me read this to you real quick. In uh, Acts chapter 15, 1, New Testament, just straight running, tells us this was going on. In verse uh, Acts 15, 1, it says, But some men came down from Judea. That means they were probably Jewish leaders. Because some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, that's Christians, that unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Right? They're like Jesus and circumcision or you're not going to heaven. And that's why Paul is writing and going, don't run back to slavery. Now, here's a question. Why, why are they, why circumcision? Like, what's that, what, what does that have to do with anything? Real quick, Genesis 17, 10. All the way back in the first book of the Bible, this is God talking here. And in Genesis 17, 10, God says, hey, this is my covenant. This is my covenant, which I want you to keep. Between me and you and your offspring after you, every male among you shall be circumcised. Now, so God tells the men of Israel, I want you to get circumcised. But then in the next verse, he says, why? I want you to listen carefully why God tells him to do this. Verse 11, he says, you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins. Why? And it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. All right? Here's what God just said. God said, I want you to do this. I want you to get circumcised because I want it to be a sign. God says, I want it to be a reminder God said, of the covenant between you and I. This love covenant I have, this be a reminder. You're like, all right. And I'm going to stop talking about circumcision real quick. It's the last thing I'm going to say about it here. But like, why, like, you're like, why in the world is circumcision a reminder of the covenant between God and man? Well, here's the thing. I did not know this. When I was preparing for this message, I, you know, I, I'd, I'd read Galatians my whole life. I remember reading that Paul was like, hey, like, you don't have to get circumcised anymore. Christ sets you free. But I was trying to, I was like, why is, why is that the thing that they were telling the people of the church to do? Like, what's the deal? Why, why circumcision? And I, so I studied it, 
And I found pretty fascinating answer to the question, okay? Um, without getting too graphic, and I don't want anybody to shout out this answer, please, but I want to ask you a rhetorical question. Do not shout out the answer. But what part of the male body passes the seed of sin from one generation to the next, right? It's not a man's ear, right? And then we know that from, like, sin is passed down from generation to generation. What part of a man's body passes that down? It's not his ear. Okay, now, the sec second question. What happens to that part of a man's body when it's circumcised? It's covered in blood, okay? Sin being covered by blood. Y'all ever heard that before? Okay, circumcision ultimately is a picture of the cross. That's what it ultimately is where Jesus shed his blood to cover our sin. For the Jews, it was meant to be a reminder of the Passover when God's about to destroy Egypt, but God tells the people, if you'll take the blood of the lamb, cover the doorpost, if I see the blood of the lamb, I will pass over and save you. Death will not come to your house. That was God giving them the covenant that I love you. I'm for you. I'm not going to bring death to your house. And blood is God. So God's like, I want you from this point forward, I want you to get circumcised to be a reminder that I love you. To be a reminder that I'm for you. To be a reminder of the covenant. But these guys, by the way, they were called the circumcision party. Isn't that great? Ain't no party like a circumcision party. But these guys were running around teaching like, hey, you got to get circumcised and put your faith in Jesus. And Paul's like, no, no, no. When Jesus shed his blood, he shed his blood once and for all time. His blood covers all your sins. You don't need Jesus and anything. As a matter of fact, what, what did Jesus say? What was the last thing Jesus said before he died? Anybody remember? He said, it is what? Finished. It's finished. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, shedding his blood, paying the penalty for your sin and for my sin, the last thing he said is, it is finished. What, what, what he didn't say was, as he hung there on the cross, is it is finished, except you got to get circumcised, right? No, it's finished. The payment is made. And so Paul is writing these people and going, anytime some knucklehead comes in here and tells you that for God to be pleased with you, if you go to heaven, you got to have Jesus plus you do something else that's alive from the pit of hell, and you need to walk in the freedom that God gave you through Jesus Christ. All right? Absolutely love this. Now, I'm going to start applying this, and we'll land the plane. Church, why is it such a big deal? that we believe in the freedom Christ gave us on the cross? Why is it such a big deal when somebody comes in and tells you, for God to love you and be pleased with you, um, you need Jesus and something else? Like, why is it? Why is that such a big deal? I'm going to give you the number one reason. All right, here it is. I'm going to put it up on the screen. Because when people teach that you need Jesus plus something else, that minimizes the power of the blood of Jesus. Not in reality, but in our minds. But anybody tells you that for you to go to heaven, you need Jesus, plus you need to do something else, that is minimizing the power of the blood of Jesus. And I just told you, last thing Jesus said is, it is finished. What was finished? The law was satisfied. The law was fulfilled. The veil of the temple that separated us from the presence of God was torn. Uh, the throne of God is now approachable. Our sins are completely and totally forgiven. That's what it means to be finished. And every, this is it, check this out. And every single time that we think we need to add something to faith in Jesus, Jesus, that's great you died, but I, I got to do X, Y, and Z. It's just like you standing at the foot of the cross. You standing at the foot look, of the cross looking up at the, the broken 
bloody body of Jesus as he shed his blood to pay for your sins and looking at him and going, good try, Jesus, but that's not enough. I don't know about y'all, but I got to believe that because the scripture tells us to be true, that there is not a sin in your life more powerful than the blood of Jesus Christ. Absolutely, positively, completely forgives you of your sin. And we think we got to do anything to add to the sacrifice of Jesus. It's like we're saying, Jesus, what you did for me is not enough. And the Bible is saying, no, y'all got that wrong. When Jesus died, it was everything. It completely and totally, utterly took away your sin. I lived um, in a, I, I grew up in a church not too far down the road that subtly taught the Jesus hand. And, um, and let me say this, let me back up. I, I think that you may not realize it, but I would bet there's a good number of us in the room that you're a Christian, but you've kind of run back to the slavery of thinking that you got to add to what Jesus did on the cross for God to be satisfied with you, love you, like you, go to heaven. Why do I say that? Because I did it most of my life. Went to First Baptist, Athens, Texas. They were good people. And they introduced me to Jesus, which I'm super thankful of. But they subtly taught the Jesus hand. And it wasn't Jesus in circumcision. It wasn't Jesus following the law. But it was Jesus that, it was Jesus in morality is what they taught. Um, they taught that, like, hey, yeah, you need to put your faith in Jesus, but you need, to, you need to absolutely make sure that you're not doing this and you're not doing that and you're not doing that or God's not going to be pleased with you. Some of y'all might have grown up in a church like that. One of the examples that I can remember was um, the True Love Waits campaign. And what that was, I grew up in the 80s and 90s, and the True Love Waits campaign was, it was this thing where they were trying to get teenagers not to have sex. And that's, that's a good thing. You're supposed to wait until we're married, but why? Why do we wait till we're married? Well, what they were teaching me is sex before marriage is a sin. And if you do it, God's not going to be pleased with you. And he's going to take away your blessing. And you just might get herpes, right? That's what, they, that's what they taught me. Instead of teaching me why God created sex, which is when a man and a woman come together in the covenant of marriage and that God created sex to be a physical picture of his one flesh union, his unbreakable love for us in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and because God is so amazing and his gospel is so good and he loves us so much and he forgives us all our sins, then what a joy and an honor it is to save ourselves uh, into marriage. They didn't teach me that. They're like, if you mess up, you just might get smoked by God. And you for sure will lose your blessing. And so, well, guess what? I love God, but I messed up, went too far with my girlfriend, and guys, I was devastated. I was devastated for a couple reasons. Number one is I love the Lord. I don't want to let him down. But I, I thought I, I've lost his blessing in my life. It's over. I'm not going to have a good marriage. Like, it, it's over. So I just walked around, even though I was a Christian. My sin had been forgiven. I walked around just with incredible amount of shame. And so I'd make all these commitments to God. All right, God, I'm never going to do that again. But I'd mess up, and I'd do it again. And so now I'm not just walking around with shame, but now I'm walking around with fear. <laughs> oh, man, God, you're going you're gonna to take me out like, because I can't, I can't do it. Like, and then I'd go to Christian summer camp in the summer and some guy like me would stand up and preach and I'd get convicted and I'd make, God, I'm never, ever, ever going to mess up again. And that'd last for about three or four weeks and then mess up again. And at that point, I sinned again. I've gone from shame uh, to fear. And then it went a final step of just, I hated myself. 
self-loathing. Gosh, I must not be saved. And so I would run from God. And the whole point of this book, I'm going to land the plane right now. The whole thing that Paul is saying, if he were taking me to coffee, he would go, Matt, you have fallen prey to the to the heresy, to the falsehood of Jesus and. He would say, you have fallen into the trap that the enemy wants you to fall into, which is the enslavement of works-based Christianity. He would ask me a question. He'd say, Matt, have you put your faith in Jesus? I'd be like, yeah. Do you want to follow him? You're like, yeah, I do. Then he'd look at me, and, and this is what he would say. He would say, Matt, then you need to understand something. At the moment you trusted in Christ, the second that you put your faith in him, here's what happened. Because Jesus' blood is more powerful than ever sin. And the moment you trusted in Christ, every sin that you've ever committed in your past, all the way to ever, every sin you'll ever commit in the future of your life. I'm talking about the the big sins and the little sins. I'm talking about the past sins and the future sins. I'm talking about the internal sins and the external sins. I'm talking about the ones that, that nobody knows about. I'm talking about all of them. When Jesus shed his blood and you put your faith in him, what Jesus did is he took every single solitary one of your sins and he removed them from you and he cast them away from you as far as the east is from the west. You are completely and totally and utterly forgiven. And the best part is that because of Jesus, plus nothing, now when God looks at you, he doesn't see a, a kid that messes up. He, he sees a beloved son that he is well pleased in. So in light of that, that God, already, because of Jesus, God already loves you and accepts you and always will. In light of that, now go walk in holiness. That changes everything. If you're here this morning and you're not a believer, there's never been a time in your life where you've said, God, I've, I've fallen short of your glory. I've sinned. I've failed you. What this is all about is not you following a set of rules. It's not about you trying harder. All you have to do is ask Christ to forgive you. And it's done. It's finished. For those of you that are believers, if you're here today and you're like, Matt, I'm a believer, but I've been kind of walking on the Jesus hand. <laughs> what the Holy Spirit inspired word of God is saying, Christ has set you free. Do not go back again and put on the burden of slavery. Let's pray. I want you to take a second. We're done today. And if you're one of those people that I was talking about that you've never in your life asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins, make you righteous so that when God sees you, he sees a beloved son or daughter. Just in the best way you know how, just ask him right now, say, Jesus, I just want to give my life to you and I ask you to forgive me my sins. If you're here and you, you're a Christian that's been struggling with the Jesus and and thinking God's displeased with you, would you just believe today that Jesus' blood is more powerful than any one of your sins and God sees you right now and he's so pleased with you. So just come home. Just come home. Father, we love you. God, we praise you. It's been an honor to be in your house today. It's been an honor to worship you. It's been an honor to sit under your word. Lord, I pray that this would be a church, that the Avenue Church would walk in and experience the freedom that you gave us through Jesus. God, we ask these things in Jesus Christ's mighty name. Amen. Amen. Church, I love you. You're dismissed. Y'all have a great weekend.